This is FRM Part 1, Book 4, Valuation and Risk Management, and the chapter on measures of financial risk. Of course, there are lots of measures of financial risk that we learned back in our original statistics days, and then, of course, over our professional careers. If you go way, way back to the old days, to one of the original measures of risk, which was just the range. And I remember my first experience with the range occurred when I was in college. And over the summers, I worked uh, in construction. And as the sun was coming up, I would always pray for rain in the morning so I didn't have to go to work. But then uh, my dad would wake me up and he would say, come on, son, it's gonna, temperature is going to be between 78 and 82 degrees today. It's going to be a great day to work out in the sunshine. And I remember thinking, you know what? My dad was never right about that range because he was a non-professional weatherman. But it gives really a good idea of what that range can provide and what its weaknesses are in terms of a measure of financial risk. And then, of course, over the years, we added things like standard deviation and covariance and, and beta. And then, you know, these series of chapters is a focus on value at risk. So that's really what we're talking about in this chapter. And you see this in the learning objectives. We're going to start with mean variance. We're going to go all the way back to Harry Markowitz in 1952. And then, of course, talk about value at risk, some assumptions, some properties, and then extend that to uh, some expected shortfall measure and then a spectral risk measure. And it seems like every chapter has some mention of scenario analysis, and this chapter is no different. All right, so let's start with the mean variance framework. What we're doing here is we are making the assumption that the first moment of the distribution, which is the mean, and the second moment of the distribution, which is the standard deviation, are all that you need to describe the entire distribution. So that, by definition, then, is a normal distribution. And then, if you, of course, if you go way, way back to that central limit theorem, and my favorite uh, statistician, that Russian guy named Chebyshev, they came up with this, uh, with this little picture down there that if you make 100 observations of something, of some random variable, that about 68% of them will fall within uh, one standard deviation. So about 68 out of 100, 95 out of those 100 will fall within two standard deviations. And then 99.7 will fall within three standard deviations. And so I always tell my students that think of an, a normal distribution, think of that bell-shaped curve as uh, putting a mirror right there where the mean is and you kind of see the reflection. So one side is the mirror image or the reciprocal of the other side. Now, of course, what we're talking about here in this series of chapters is not so much of what goes happen way, way up on the right side of the normal distribution. The right tail, what we're worried about is the left tail. Remember from the last chapter, we talked about the need for an awareness of those fat tails on the left side, which indicate substantial losses that are not captured by the normal distribution. Here's one of my favorite pictures of all time. This is the picture of the efficient frontier. Notice that on the horizontal axis, there's standard deviation. On the vertical axis, there's some measure of return. Let's call it an expected return. And what Harry Markowitz did in his dissertation in 1952 was say the following. He said, look, I can plot all of these individual securities on here based on their standard deviation and their expected return. But I can use some calculus. I can minimize standard deviation subject to the constraint that the weights have to sum to one. And I can determine optimal weights so that I can put these in a portfolio that pushes things to the left and pushes things northward. I always give my students the image of these big, tough football players when they're at practice and they're, and they're practicing blocking the sled. And so think about what Harry Markowitz is trying to do. He's trying to push, he's trying to push everything back to the vertical axis. So those football players are pushing and squeezing and squeezing over there to, mi to minimize risk. And so this efficient frontier is nothing more than the locus of efficient points based on all of those financial assets that fall either on the line or below it. 
So look at that second block point I have there. For every point on the efficient frontier, there is at least one portfolio that can be constructed from all available investments that has the expected return, the expected risk and return corresponding to that point. Now that area, that area up and to the left, that northwest corner, that's called the unattainable region. In other words, you just you just can't get up there. But I tell my students to think of those football players. What they're trying to do is they're trying to push, they're trying to push that efficient frontier to the left and northward. And of course, the reality of life is it's not really the football players that are doing this, but that's a good image. It's the financial analysts, it's the executives, it's investors who are trying to gather as much information as possible to find stocks and bonds and alternative investments that are going to move that efficient frontier up and to the left. Now, of course, down below on the right, those portfolios are called inefficient. Now, important to remember here, portfolio A, portfolio B, portfolio D, those things all fall directly on the efficient frontier. So they are efficient portfolios. But that doesn't mean that every investor is indifferent between and among investing in A or B or D or any other one along those lines. Ah, from that, to make that decision, we need the investor's indifference curves, which is summarized in that final block point. The choice between optimal portfolios will depend on the individual investor's appetite for risk. So just think of it this way, that conservative investors will tend to fall somewhere around A. Aggressive investors will fall somewhere around D. But they're all efficient, that's important. Boy, this picture sums up what I was saying just a minute ago. What are the limitations of the mean variance uh, framework? Look, that fat tail down on the bottom left, the empirical curve, or what do we call that? The asset distribution curve, that is not going to be symmetric. So that normal distribution is not going to fully capture those fat tails on the bottom left, which, and look at that last uh, bold point I made, I made there, the mean variance framework churns out misleading estimates of risk. And that's simply because that the asset returns, like stock returns and bond returns and, and alternative investment returns, typically do not follow a perfectly normal distribution. It's, it's nearly normal. I'm not sure that that's a good finance term. It's nearly normal, but it's, it's abnormal enough so that, so that uh, standard deviation can be misleading. And that's, of course, why um, professionals came up with this measure of value at risk. What they were trying to do is say, OK, here, let me go back to that previous one. Uh, what what these professionals were trying to do is say, all right, let's go ahead and try to figure out what can happen if things go against us. And then what's the dollar value of that bad thing, that negative event that can happen to us? So they call this value at risk. And some people like to interpret value at risk as the maximum amount of loss under normal business conditions given like a 5% or a 10% confidence level. But it's also viewed by many as the worst possible loss under normal conditions over a specified period. All right, so here, here's just a quick example. If we have a monthly value at risk of $100 million, 95% confidence, what that means that in 95% of the months, we expect the fund to lose no more than 100 million. Whoa. Uh, in other words, we're only going to lose 100 million or more 5% of the time. Now, those interpretations are a little bit misleading. So here, here's the limitation here. The value at risk does not really describe the worst possible loss. It describes the best case scenario of those worst possible series of losses. Value at risk indicates probability of a value occurring, but look, it stops short of describing what happens down in that left-hand tail of the distribution. 
Now, of course, value at risk is dependent on the confidence level, right? Who's to, I mean, standard statistics and econometrics textbooks use 95% confidence level. I mean, that's pretty much a standard or accepted practice, but who's to say 95% is better than 96% or 94%? And then, of course, the other part of that is that are we doing this over a week or over a month or over a quarter or over a semi-annual period? Who's to say 33 days is not more important than, than 30 days? And so these are limitations of, of value at risk. And so look in the, in the blue highlight down there. These estimates in using the value at risk model are subject to model risk. I emphasized this in a previous video. video. Um, of course, the model risk means that we are making assumptions that are not realistic or that are inaccurate or that are incorrect. And then there's implementation risk as well, in which this means that, well, we have this data and we have this series of stuff and we maybe ignore some things or maybe we put too much emphasis on some things. And so the actual implementation uh, process has errors inside of it. All right, so let's think of the chronology of this. We have all of these events that go on that have this fat tail. So professionals and academics came up with this concept of a value at risk. And this at first seemed to kind of solve the problem. However, however, it didn't completely solve the problem. So then the academics came up with this idea of a coherent risk measure. And there are four properties of uh, every risk measure that has to be coherent, which means that unless it follows these four properties, then it is not a risk measure that's going to be complete, right? All right, so the first one, monotonicity. Uh, what this simply means is that if you have a function and you take the first derivative of the function and the first derivative is positive, that means the function is increasing. And then if the first derivative is negative, that means the that means that the function is decreasing. But of course, applied to portfolios, what this means is that if you if you take a look at every state of nature in the world, suppose there are five states of nature and you're evaluating two financial assets. And in every state of the nature, one of those portfolios has a lower value. Well, then you have to assign it the characteristic that it has higher risk. Uh, sub additivity, this has everything to do with correlation. So um, if you add two portfolios, total risk is going to be less for the combined portfolio um, than the sum of the two individual risks, comma, right? Can I put a comma in there? Of course, we're assuming that the correlation coefficient between and among all these portfolios is not perfectly one. So merging portfolios ought to reduce risk. Uh, Homogeneity simply means that if you have a value at risk of 10 for a portfolio that has uh, a value of, let's say, 100, and then you add another 100 to it, well, then the value at risk had to be, ought, to be, ought to be 20. I think that's what I said. Yeah. So what do I have written down there? Should result in a proportionate scale in its risk measure. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the translation invariance, this has everything to do with adding cash to the portfolio. And oh my gosh, I'm just going to be so excited to go back here to this one here. You guys should remember that if I put a risk-free asset over on that uh, vertical asset a axis, like the return on a treasury bill, it turns the relationship linear. Oh my heavens, that is so cool. And so what does this mean? That if we add cash to the portfolio, we are going to be able to reduce the risk by the amount of cash that we invest in that portfolio. Now, here's the problem with the value at risk. It violates that sub additivity principle. And let me put some parentheses there. It, it violates the sub additivity principle only when the distribution is not normal. So when the distributions have fat tails, which we which we know that they do, then uh, value at risk is not a coherent risk measure. So look at the question I have. So so what are we what are we going to use? You know, just when we think we have something that we like, then we find something that it's not perfect. And boy, oh boy, this is really the sense of what you get as a risk manager. You really have to try to figure out what do I keep telling you guys? Identify the risk, quantify. So quantify this is really important here. 
and then and then manage the risk. So what we're doing is we're always learning. We're never going to have a consensus that says, okay, risk management principles are established and they're not dynamic. They're never changing again. So we're always learning. So how about how about expected shortfall? I mean, this is really just an average losses beyond beyond some predetermined range or some predetermined amount. Uh, I have a quick example here. Suppose the 5% value at risk for a fund is a minus 25%. So what does that say? 5% of the time, uh, the fund will earn a return that's less than a mi minus 25%. So the expected shortfall gives us an expected value of all returns that fall below that. And th there is a picture there that uh, you can kind of go from the mean all the way out there to the loss. And remember, the vertical axis there is frequency. Here's a quick example. Suppose we go over the last 31 trading days and we have all these uh, we have all these returns on a financial asset and they're ordered. Notice they go from a minus 18 percent all the way up to a positive 29 percent. So they're, they're ordered. Now, the question then is, what is the value at risk and the expected shortfall at a 90 percent confidence level? Well, no, we have 30, 31 days, right? So so 10% of that 31 is, 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 is about three. Can I do about three? So let's go to the third worst return. That's a minus 14%. And what we want to do is we want to go from the 14% all the way to the left and then just take the average. So look at the bottom there, the expected shortfall equation. We take the 14 and we add the 16 and we uh, we add the 18 divide by three. So note that where these are equally weighted. And so that gives us um, some arithmetic average of uh, minus 16 percent. Now, of course, you should be saying to yourselves, wait a minute, Jim, uh, we've learned lots and lots of stuff here about the problems associated with assigning equal weights to something, whatever, whatever that something is. So the spectral risk measure is going to give us uh, uh, some other, some other kind of a weighting function. And so that's what we're going to do there. All, all of the other quantiles have a weight of zero, but for those tail losses, we're going to set the weight equal to one uh, the reciprocal of one minus the confidence level. And then the last uh, learning objective here goes back to what we've talked about many, many times with scenario analysis and uh, following a scenario analysis. And remember in the last chapter, we talked about the importance of a Monte Carlo simulation. Those results can be interpreted as a coherent risk measure. So that's important. Now, in order to do this, these fat tails or those loss out outcomes have to be assigned probabilities. And that's, of course, you know, one of the big challenges there. But those losses can be viewed as representative of the tail distributions um, of that, that distribution function. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify not only the value at risk, but we're trying to identify what the fat tail looks like. Is it going to be a little thing like this, like maybe a dime, or is it going to be a half dollar, or is it going to be as big as a uh, as big as a basketball? And I think that takes us through this chapter.